Hello, welcome to Skype Core Testing Service. Scanning for audio. Hello and welcome to a Tin Dog podcast, a nice special one, this time interviewing Jenny T. Colgan, also known as, of course, Jenny Colgan, who's produced some rather nice Doctor Who stuff that I'm sure we'll be talking about at any length of time. So here we go. Hello, Jenny. Hello there. Hi, nice to speak to you. There you are. Now, obviously, I'm not expecting you to have heard the Tin Dog podcast before, but um, Macy, are you at all a podcast listener? Well, do you know, here's, I have a real problem, not just with podcasts, but with radios, which is that my mother was an obsessive Radio 4 listener, uh, which meant from when I was really tiny, I kind of learned to just block out <laughs> anybody speaking on the radio so that I could go and read a, a Doctor Who book. Um, so uh, actually, no, I tend to listen to, if I am in a happy working mode, upbeat pop music, and if I'm in a very difficult working mode, I, listen, I like to listen to very repetitive, kind of Michael Nyman uh, type, Philip Glass type music Oh, some Bach, that'll do it too I'm guessing you've got a massive collection of soundtrack albums then Yes, yes, yeah I do actually yeah, there's all sorts of, I like Vin Burton's and all sorts of um, soundtrack, in fact um, having um, oh goodness, my mind has gone completely blank the Doctor Who, having Murray has been, I think, such a huge part in New Who's success. You know, the way he just made it so big and awesome and exciting. I know. Right, right. It's the 16th of May today. It's basically David Tennant Day on Twitter. Are you excited? I mean, let's face it, you've brought back, you've done story two of the David Tennant box set. And um, has it kind of affected you a bit? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, actually, I think as we speak, they are desperately working really hard at Big Finish to get the servers back up. <laughs> They've crashed the system. Um, it has been extremely, it's been a roller coaster, such a hideous cliche for anyone to use, never mind a writer. But yeah, it has been kind of anxiety, followed by excitement, followed by terror, followed by some misery. So yeah, it has, it's been, it's been up and down, but there you go, we're, we're here. We're finally out. I'm sure 10,000 people had already downloaded it beforehand, so I think we're all right. And I'm sure by the time they get to hear this interview, everything will oh, be sorted. Oh, they'll have sorted it. Yeah, yeah, we know. But I will say, I've got the uh, the CDs, and the CDs look tremendous. The covers are grey, and they have a really nice um, kind of 2008 feel about them. Oh, I know, I know. I must admit, I've heard them myself, and I'm a huge fan, especially, well, I'm not going to be all fawning, but your story was particularly good. Now, I've got one question. On the back of every single one of your books, it tells the same story. It says that as a child, you met Peter Davison, who mistook you for a boy. Mm, yes. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell us the actual full story so that we know it once and for all and we can <laughs> let it go? Of course. Although, funny enough, the more the longer I work in Who, of course, the more people I met that entered that competition, which was in 1981, 82, thereabouts. And it was to meet dot who but when when the competition kind of came up it was tom baker who was a big deal as far as i was concerned so i entered the competition with my cousins we got all the answers it was for target books and i won astonishingly and uh it took forever they changed doctors by the time i got to go down to the taping of what was frontios uh, that I, I didn't obviously i didn't know that at the time but i, I know that now it's frontios and uh, Tegan was there and Nissa was there, who I thought was the most beautiful person I'd ever seen in my life. I still think that. And uh, Turlow was there, whom I was quite scared of. And the fact that he was very charming was a bit worrying. Uh, and of course, we were in the bowels of Broadcasting House and it was pitch dark. And there, of course, in the corner was this plywood uh, TARDIS. And I was very excited. And it was just after all wedding. And I had that horrible Princess Diana haircut that suited nobody, not even Princess Diana. And um, I just was looking at it with this longing. And Mr. Davison, who, of course, is quite a tall chap, kind of wandered over out of the gloom. And he said, I wouldn't look in there, son. It's very disappointing. <laughs> 
<laughs> so he told me not to go over it and touch the the the, the toes. And I think I was that I was quite young. I guess I must have been ten, going on eleven. But I was young for my age, and and I think kind of right up to that moment, I had a real sense that um, the, the doctor might be real. <laughs> they know that it, they might actually go to just want to come, and I would go, yeah, all right, that'd be fine. And um, so yes, it was it was quite the eye opener. The, uh, the the props department had um, tin foil, and they had some mattresses. I remember, and they were putting the tin foil on the mattresses to make them look like space mattresses. You know, I thought I'm I'm not sure this is real. You know. <laughs> But it was uh, it was lovely, and actually, there's two nice codas to the story. One is well, a few actually. Pete Harness, of course, the great Doctor Who writer. Every time I run into him, he growls at me because he really wanted to win that competition and did not. Uh, the other person uh, who entered that competition and did not win uh, was a very young David McDonald, who was just up the road from me, who changed his name to Tennant and did quite well later. And yeah, well, to be fair, he got to spend a lot of time on set himself, so it doesn't I, count. I feel in the long run, he certainly did. Yeah, he did. He did win uh, the competition in a way. And <laughs> then the other nice thing is, I got a phone call from the BBC archive out of the blue, saying, "We believe that you were here on such and such a day. Can you confirm it?" And, and of course, I did. And I'm in the official back in the bills of, of well, Television Centre is not there anymore, but I am officially in the kind of official line of who, if you like. Uh, I'm I'm always going to be there, and that makes me feel really pleased. Well, that's lovely. Now, what I've done is I've uh, been on Divergent Universe and I've asked the people on the forum if they've got any questions for you. But before I go into those questions, I've got one last one. Now, we know for a fact that you are ridiculously well known um, for what's rather disparagingly known in some phrases as chiclet, which is where you made your mark originally. But of course, being Doctor Who fans, we were all hanging around with our virgin adventures and some of us hadn't even noticed your existence. Then you turn up and you go, oh, yeah, I'm just writing a few books. And a lot of us have that suspicious face. And then we read the books and we don't have the suspicious face at all anymore. So you've gone from Jenny Colgan, Jenny T. Colgan, when you're hanging around with us. Is the tea a real tea or is it like Russell T. Davis's tea? It is Russell T. Davis's tea because I don't have a middle name. And my other publishers, my, my romantic comedy publishers, uh, have, you know, they put a lot of effort into kind of trying to build me up and put me in bookshops and things like that. And so we wanted to make sure that you wouldn't get mixed up. I'm sorry about that noise. My dog is eating something. Neville should come here. And right, I'll say that again. Um, so you know, my publishers wanted to make sure that that we couldn't get confused uh, in any way. And so I, as a kind of homage to Russell, I, I put that team because I I don't have a middle name either, um, which was fine. And then somebody at a conference asked me what it stood for, and I was feeling mischievous. And I said, "Oh, it stands for Tardis," which I really regret saying now because it comes up all the time. And every there's always some wag that thinks it's hilarious. Go, oh, you bigger on the inside than the outside. <laughs> so yeah, so it's a terrible regret that I did that now, but too late to change it. That's all right with us. We promise not to do the same jokes everyone else. <laughs> we do. Uh, right. Now, I've got a big pile of stuff here because I, I went to my bookcase and I went, oh, I'll just get them out so I've got them in front of me. And then I realised you've written considerably more than I thought because I've got the lovely hardback copy of Time Trips with um, with all of with that tremendously wonderful um, dust jacket which you can unfold yeah, Morris's dust jacket isn't yeah, that a wonderful that is so nice it's a very good hand there we are. Um, and then of course we've got Dark Horizons which was the first time you know people like us noticed you and went oh that's remarkably good and has proper Vikings in it hooray but you've also got a nice bit of Legends of the Shielder and you've got River, the Legends of River Song which is out sort of next well in the next few weeks I think it's already out electronically, but it's out physically in the next few weeks. And then, of course, you've got In the Blood, which is out now. And I would be remiss of saying, can you, well, sell it to us. Sell us In the Blood. <laughs> I don't need to sell you In the Blood because it's a very clear pitch, that it, which is that it's Ten and Donna, who are always fun and hilarious. And they uh, and it's about internet trolls, um, people that write kind of nasty things on the internet, start getting this virus, and and uh, kind of dying. And at first, no one's that fussed because they're not very nice. And obviously, the doctor doesn't see people in those terms, so they have to kind of go on a globe trotting adventure to, um, to 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 track it down. I had such 
fun within the book. Because the lovely thing about writing full-length novels as opposed to shorter pieces or audio, in fact, is that, that this, you just have more generosity of time. It doesn't need to take place in 45 minutes or an hour or over a, you know, a short period of time. Yeah. So you can do the stuff I really like doing. I'm, very, I'm a terrible one for sending people into the TARDIS because it was what I liked when I was a child. Uh, mm. You know, they have to silly like they have to you have to work out on logistics you know so they go to sleep places and get places and that that kind of stuff to me is great fun i love doing all of that so um it's a kind of boring identity style fast paced earth adventure don't look too closely about the dating it's a bit unit dating in terms of when it's set but apart from that i think um everyone who likes the doctor and donna is going to like it well, to be fair, we've now got the Dr. Donna audios and we're not going to be that bothered about when they're set either. Um, so I don't think that's really an issue. And we've been dealing with unit dating long enough just to go, oh, look, something shiny. Yes, I- so it's fine. <laughs> it's really not a problem. And I must admit, I have read it myself and it's marvellous. Oh, I'll do a proper too. review very soon, but uh, I am a very big fan. And it's, uh, I hate using the word romp. I genuinely don't like using it because, you know, I know more words than that. I'm fairly eloquent, but it does. It just, it hits the ground running. Like you said, born identity. It's a thriller. It's an actual thriller. There's there's a scene on an aeroplane which you can picture so visually uh, while reading it that you're going is this an adaptation of something i've seen like one of those old target books and you're going no this is better so yeah you do get that thriller aspect but it is so doctor and ten how did you go about capturing their voice or do you just know them like we do because obviously you're one of us i think I just, so I, well i just i i don't i, I mean also particularly that because uh, david was such a beneficiary of that real lennon mccartney stephen and russell era of of this you know the run that he had the amount of not just good episodes as astonishing episodes that he had that stand up so silence in the library stands up turn left you can watch it forever um uh the family of blood you can watch over and over again blink doesn't need anything said about it um he has an ex- uh, for girl in the fireplace uh, just an astonishing array of tremendous episodes so they're very easy to watch um donna i i, I think i have a, quite a lot in common with in a way we're about the same age we would be really keen uh, to go in the tardis and, and and have a brilliant time all the time and you know i'm probably not quite as shouty um so yeah i, I mean then my trouble always is cutting down on them chit chat I would happily listen to when I was writing for Big Finish I really didn't want them to do anything I, I would happily just listen to them bantering around the tortoise for hours and actually my favourite scene in it is the very last one where they're off to the library of all places um, just just chat just, just being themselves you know and, and I think they bring out the best in each other he's not as mopey when she's there and you know she, she, she has a lot more self confidence when she is Right. Oh, while I've got you on, I just need to say that um, in ja- back in January, um, uh, everyone who's listened to the show knows all this already. But um, and I got run over and I ended up in hospital. And I was supposed to be um, reviewing uh, the Legends of a Shielder at this point, so I had the copy of the book and I was reading it. So, um, sort of two nights in, um, I think just before one of the operations I had, um, I was reading your story. And uh, I must admit, it is one of the single most touching bits of literature I've ever read in any form. And uh, it's heart, it's genuinely soul destroying. Because I'm guessing you went to the pitch meeting and everyone went, let's do the Legends of a Shielder. We'll all do some nice, funny stories about her life. And you sat there and went, I want to do about the death of her children. Yay, that's for me. So how did that? It was when I watched, I was a astonished at what they got away with. I was astonished that they could do that. I had the scripts I did, I, uh, so it was before it was on because I was pitching before it was on. And I thought, seriously, because the one thing you do not do in Doctor Who is kill a child and they killed three of them. And they killed them like that. And I, I, Although I think it was brilliant and I think the, the writing was, was, was great and I think Kath is an, a wonderful new writer. Um, but I I, my, I did feel that the Doctor gets off very lightly for what he did, because what he did was a terrible thing, and I, 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 we know that immortality would be a terrible thing. Um, so, I, so yeah, I know it's, it's, it's kind of probably uncharacteristic because I'm quite a bouncy writer in general, and, and, but I was so furious, I think because I have three children, the fact that mm. they killed three children in five seconds of screen time and kind of, you know, wobbled on and, and, and did some kind of gags about highwaymen. I was, I was quite... I was, Appearance. So, um, 
Yeah, so I, I just... And the funny thing is, normally, if I was to wander up, as I would normally do, and go, oh, I would like to do this, or such and such, then they would have said no right away. But because it had already been done, that it was happening, that she was going to have three dead children, then, then I was I was desperate that, to have a crack at it. Also, the other thing in the script is that uh, the doctor cries when, when he reads about this. And um, and I thought, there you go, write a story to make the doctor cry. There's a challenge <laughs> not to shy away from. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite proud of that one, actually. Well, um, rightly so. Okay, now, before I'm, at a, I'm torn now, because... Uh, personally, I want to ask you great, long, convoluted questions about your writing technique, about the setup you've got going and things like that. But that's going to bore lots of my listeners rigid. But it's the sort of thing that I want to know about. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to some of the questions that the Divergent Universe people asked and go through those. Because I also don't want to bore you rigid and ask you lots of other writer type questions. So here we go. One from someone called Mucky Pup. Which doctor is your doctor? Well, Peter Davis is my doctor um, in terms of being at that kind of pivotal moment of my life. Uh, really, I mean, Tom Baker was a fan, but he was very young and I loved it, but I, I, I was always a bit... Well, I, I, I can't bear to rewatch Warrior's Gate because I loved it so much when I was that age, but it made no sense... Um, to me at the time, and I, I it was, still doesn't. I know, I know, and that's why I don't want to watch it. It's like a dream that I had, that beautiful dream. Don't tell that. Stephen Gallagher. Yeah, the, um, it's fine. <laughs> so yeah, no, but then Pete, with Peter, you know, I watched every single one, and I adored him, and I cared a lot about the girls, and uh, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. So he he's my defining era doctor, and I always think it's interesting. How old are you, if you don't mind me asking? Um, nineteen seventy-two. I'm forty yeah. odd. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I'm guessing we've got fairly similar experiences. I think it's so interesting I, that we're all the same age, or how many of us are exactly the same age. And my exactly. My theory is that we were about seven or eight that big Douglas Adams year with City of Death mm. and all of that. So we, yeah, I, I think it hit us a really good time for the for the show. You know that we all came in in about 1977, and that was a big deal. Um, it was yeah you're right you're so right um, and of course and uh, yeah my my everyone's aware of this but my first major crush was on Tegan so I completely get what you were saying about everyone at that time yeah it's just when it hits you so so yeah Peter's my Peter's my daughter Peter one is my daughter ah yes oh Peter what I hadn't even thought about there being more than one but you're so right okay next question which classic story obviously you'll have given this some thought <laughs> do you wish you'd written um, a, 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 a Trial of a Time Lord, I like. Brain of Morbius, I like to all, all of Trial of a Time Lord or just one no, bit? Yeah, I know. It's a good question. I don't know. I, oh, I suppose, I suppose if you were going to write one, you'd write City of Death because it's so clever, so witty. And also, I'll tell you what you like about City of Death, it's one of those ones you can show to a non who fan and they'll still like it. Uh, and those are to be treasured. You know, there's very few people in the world that you can show Blink to that won't like it. Uh, and I think City of, of Death is like that too. Uh, right, I've got one here from uh, Whiskey Brewer. Um, which doctor, apart from the ones you've written for, would you like to write for? I have Chris, I've never written for Chris. Uh, so I've written for all, I haven't written for Tom. Um, mm. but loads of other people do that incredibly well and I read a lot of those targets as well so uh, and I've written for yeah so I've written for everyone else that I really desperately want to write for except for Chris and Rose and I would like to do that Is your intention to hang on until he finally changes his mind one morning and goes yes. actually these big Finnish people sound alright It's going to happen yes yes, I have It's got to one day no doubt. <laughs> with with no with no foreknowledge whatsoever, we're just sitting here idly going, Of course it's gonna happen one day because happen. we wish it. Um, yes. He'll roll up one, one yeah. Now I've got one from here from someone called Tau, which is T O A A U, and I cannot pronounce that, so forgive me. Uh, they are, I'm supposed to mention that they also love Dark Horizons. Um but which Doctor Who story that you've written do you consider it to be your best? Or is it always the last one you did? Oh, no, it's never the last one you did. Or is it always the next one? <laughs> yeah, it's always the next one. Uh, I am really fond of Picnic at Asgard just because it was such a cheeky thing to do. It wasn't like a shoulder where there was a gap in the story to be told mm. or, or in the blood where, you know, they kind of were looking for something else set or whatever. Uh, Picnic at Asgard, they said, do you want to write a short for River? And I went, oh, yes. And I knew that Stephen was doing the Singing Terrors of Dunalium for last Christmas. I knew that was happening. 
and of course picnic and scar singing and terrors those are the two things that come up and i said well i guess i hadn't seen the script and i said well i guess it's about you know everyone's gonna be thinking one day about whether she would want to have children and they went what no oh my god disgusting Ugh, children and i said well i i wouldn't write that then because she is mostly human and they kind of went no you can't write that and then I, I, a couple of weeks later so you can conspiracy theory this one uh, I got word back from Cardiff that they'd had to think about it and decided that I could write about River <laughs> having children. And, I, and they said, but you got to do it with 10. I went, yeah, no, no, I've got to do it with 11 because I'm not going in with 10. And um, they came back and said, okay. And I wrote it and it's, I, I don't know. I am very, um, very, very proud of it. And it's, I think it's funny. Asgard's a kind of, uh, it's like a Disneyland planet uh, where you go and pretend to be Vikings and there's all sorts of cool things they get to do. You couldn't film it you know, for less than 150 million pounds, you know. Um, but, yeah, I'm really fond of it. Um, right, and finally, from uh, from the Divergent Universe questions, um, Acoustic Wolf asks, which TARDIS team would you like to have been part of? Oh, uh, Ness and Tegan. And, actually, they don't, Ness and Tegan, they don't go with Trello, uh, except for once. There's only once mm. that they're all together. Uh, and, and that's the laugh-a-minute romp that is Terminus. Seriously, then they go to Terminus. <laughs> Um, but do you know? I like. I think you can have a gang, and I think it can be done. And it would be interesting. Mm. It would be. It's difficult, and it's interesting. You know, they just make Nissa faint and cut her off for like three episodes, and obviously we had longer. <laughs> yeah, where this weird Walkman thing. Oh, you've gone to sleep for a whole story. Uh, Bye. She's very good at fainting. She's very elegant fainting. Um, she but is. you know, they were a gang, and I like that. And I think now, oh my goodness, the interesting kind of things, permutations you could have between them, rather than just you know, I'll do something clever, I'll run away. Um, so that yes, that that was very much the dream. I have to say, I wasn't mad fond of Amy and Rory. I didn't like having a couple on board. It didn't really work for me. Um, especially was it going to be a triangle or wasn't it? Well, it wasn't. So um, so yeah. In terms of gangs, I think that was definitely the one to be involved in. Well, that's the last of the questions from the Divergent Universe, and I must admit, um, I've been very grateful that we could have this chat. The um, the last thing that I'd like to deal with is that I know you've been doing these big finishes, but you've also done a few others. You've uh, you've also dealt well. You've had River Song do your lines on audio. Yes. Oh my goodness! I have such a girl crush on her. She's so lovely. She's exactly what you think she'd be like. Just kind of gorgeous, really beautiful, and really nice. And uh, yes, that was fun. But it's quite audio is a real learning process for me because I haven't been, mm. I've written dozens of novels and I haven't written a lot of plays and I certainly haven't written uh, much radio although I've written a lot of screenplays and, and so on. So um, yeah, so it's it's kind of I think I you know I'm working on it. I, I will get the hang of it. <laughs> I'm doing. <laughs> so what were the uh, the lessons that you you uh, you learned for for audio when you were doing it? I think my just keep the scenes short. Don't put too much ambitious world building in. Don't have people pointing at stuff all the time. Go stand, doctor. So lots of lessons. I'm working on a. Can I say yes? I can. I'm working on a Torchwood episode right now. So hopefully, marvelous. I can um, take you know everything I'm kind of getting from the, the learning curve and and and, and apply it to um, Torchwood. I uh, I'm well everyone who's listened to this show knows how much I'm really I'm thinking that the audio version of Torchwood is better than any other version of Torchwood that's ever been. What better than Children of Earth? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, oh yeah god yes for the next couple of hours <laughs> yes if if anyone uh, if anyone could possibly go back and listen to my daily reports on children of earth um yeah never do a daily podcast and uh, never review something that's such hilarious yeah but um only made worse possibly by series four i don't know why for me torchwood's at its best in series two but that's just me the world is kind of split with Torchwood. It's like you either like it at the beginning or in the middle or at the end. There's not a lot of people who liked it all the way through. No, it changes. It changes focus. It, it certainly did. But anyway, I am so glad that you're not abandoning me, Finish. And I'd like to thank you for spending some time with us. Oh, it's been really fun. Thank you. Jenny T, made up middle name, called him. <laughs> I'd like to thank you. Be seeing you. That was the Doctor Who Tin Dog Podcast, available on iTunes, YouTube, Twitter, RSS, Vimeo, and across the internet. 
Doctor Who and its associated properties are all copyright and trademark of the BBC. No infringement is intended. Why not become a supporter by visiting patreon.com slash tin dog. Contact the show on tin-dog at hotmail.co.uk. The Tin Dog Podcast is a founder member of the Doctor Who Podcast Alliance. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. Doctor Who, the 10th Doctor Adventures. What is this place? Calibris, brilliant place. An entirely mechanical planet. Catch, hitch, fuel, fix, buy pretty much any kind of transportation in existence. This empire's a massive leap in user-friendly tech. Meadow Digital's ahead of the game on the chipsets. Quadruple core nano circuits and a sleek, sexy designer package. Ultra thin. Look. You're talking, but it's all geek to me. Can we go? Yeah, I suppose. Hey! Robots running amok. Donna! We're on! Remain where you are. Bex, grab my hand. Go, Donna. One of us needs to. And I just... Come on, if you're common, don't want a dislocated shoulder for nothing. Do not run. We require test subjects. Ah, there it is. Vagabond's Reach, Tavern of Taverns, most feared social environment in the galaxy. You've never been up Sugar Heart on a Tuesday. You don't know everything about me. Ready? Is this the front door? They don't even have bouncers. Yeah, basically, think of them all as bouncers. Big finish. We love stories. What are you saying? They fizzled in somehow? Like the TARDIS? Yeah, Transmat from another dimension. The, the, the TARDIS doesn't fizzle. It's more of a... Um, yes, what I'd done is I'd plugged my headphones into my microphone and my microphone into my <laughs> headphones. Oh, yes, I've not been doing this for ten years for nothing. Oh, I can. Nobody can get Skype to work. Not really.